Every three minutes, cancer picks a fight with another Canadian. In BC, 21,000 people are newly diagnosed each year. Some of them are kids, teenagers, and young adults. Dr. Karen Goddard is a radiation oncologist who is part of the Childhood Adolescent Young Adult Cancer Survivors Research Program. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Karen Goddard to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thanks, Fanny. Thanks nice to meet me. you. A radiation oncologist means what? Uh, a radiation oncologist is somebody who primarily specializes in treating cancers with radiation. Um, I have to say it doesn't sound very glamorous, but it's a really important job. Mm -hmm. How long do you go to school to learn to do that? Well, you go to, I, I mean, it's longer and longer. In, in Canada, you do an undergraduate degree, and then you go to medical school, and then you do a residency program, and then you do a subspecialty training program. So that can take many years, more than mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I, there have been so many advances, as you know so well, in radiation, in radiation treatment. The advance, advances have been in the area of making sure that we focus correctly on the cancer and we spare surrounding normal tissue. I mean, it, it sounds very simple, really, but that's obviously the most mm -hmm. important thing. And so we have different techniques of doing that. I'm sure. Well, it sounds very technical to me because if you only want to hit a certain spot, I know sometimes they tattoo the body. They put it, well, tattoo. When I say they put a little blue dot on your body to say only focus, is it a beam? What is it? Yeah. Only focus the radiation here. So the, the radiation can be given in, in many different ways. And, and mostly it's from the outside and focused in to the patient. And the tattoos are part of the whole business of setting up people so that you know precisely where you're giving the radiation. Mm. So you have to have people in the same position so they don't move every day. And they're, they're sort of, if you like, you line them up. You use the tattoos to, to use lasers to make sure that people are in the same position. It's completely reproducible every day. Mm. So the tattoos, they're, they're not very glamorous tattoos, but they're really important. Yes, I'm sure. And, and the technicians, I've had all of this done. The technicians are very precise. Yeah. And you're right, you can't wiggle. And I know if you have a cancer, uh, like a prostate cancer or in that area, you have to drink a lot of water. I'm not sure why, before you get your radiation treatment. Yeah, well, you know, the, the prostate cancer too, this, this brings out radiation isn't just given from the outside. Mm. Sometimes it's given by implanting oh. organs with, with, with radioactive seeds. And there's a, a very active program at the Cancer Agency that treats prostate cancer sure. using that. How effective is it generally? Um, I know that's a general it, question. Yeah, it, it's so hard because it's, it's, there's such a broad range of diseases. Cancer isn't just one disease, mm -hmm. it's many things. And when you think about cancer treatment, it's not just radiation either. It's used in combination, often with chemotherapy. So if you think about adult cancers, at least 50% of people now with adult cancers will be cured, will be survivors of their cancer. But in kids, where these, uh, in children, their tumors are really responsive to chemotherapy. And so you use radiation sometimes and chemotherapy and surgery, of course, too. We've forgotten the surgeons. And all of these things, we all work together mm -hmm. To, to cure patients, and in kids, 80% of them can expect to be cured of their tumors. 80%? 80% now. And you know, when you think about it, we forget, but, but in the 1950s, I mean, it seems like a long time ago, but it's not really. But in the mm -hmm. 1950s, if you got something like Hodgkin lymphoma or leukemia, you might expect to die from that. And now, most, both those sites, you can expect at least an 80% chance of cure which is a big step mm -hmm. forward, a big improvement. Very much so. Uh, could you tell whether or not a fetus had a cancer? Yes, you can in certain that with, there's a, a tumor called neuroblastoma and you can do an ultrasound scan before birth mm -hmm. and very often these tumors can be picked up before the baby is born, but that's unusual. Most cancers develop in kids when they're, they're more than two, where they're four or six years old. Now, cancers in the first year of life, they're, they're quite rare, actually. Mm. And are they mostly blood cancers or bone cancers, uh, tumor cancers? Well, I the, know it's complex. So the, the range of cancers depends on how old you are. Mm. So if you're a kid, you are likely to have a blood cancer or a cancer of your lymph nodes, so a leukemia or a lymphoma. 
And then the next most common tumor to that is, is actually a brain tumor. And if you're adult, they're, they're all different. They're, they're, they're a different sort of tumor, actually. The commonest tumor is a carcinoma. And that's very different from childhood cancer. Yes. So uh, what does science tell us about uh, the cause of uh, a childhood cancer, uh, a leukemia? Um, it's, is it mal well, uh, well, cell gone wild? <laughs> I, I know we don't know the answer, but so we know what do you know? some answers. We know some answers. We know that there are different things that are associated. Like sometimes kids can be born with genetic conditions and can be much more likely to develop cancer. Sometimes it's, it's things like uh, radiation. I mean, I, I guess that's the Japanese situation right now. Mm. People are so concerned about the health of the population because radiation can cause leukemia. But uh, in a lot of kids, a lot of young adults, nobody really, to be honest, nobody knows why. Mm -hmm. It's just like it's nothing they've done. It's just really bad luck. There, there must be some other reason, obviously. Yes but we haven't got to the bottom of that yet. Are the epigeneticists, I know, study environmental causes, things like that, but if a, a child is only two, yeah. you wouldn't think he, he or she would be exposed to something in the environment to that degree. It, it's probably a combination of something that they're exposed to in the environment and then some other factor, maybe, maybe a genetic factor. There's a lot of work going on now looking at Ge genetic factors in people, and some people are just more prone to get mm -hmm. problems. Like with different drugs, sure. you can be, you can have a genetic profile, and you can be really likely to have a bad side effect with the drug, where somebody else might not. And so maybe that goes for environmental exposure and mm -hmm. cancer in childhood. How do you determine a dose uh, for a child that has a childhood cancer? How much a, a small body can take or not take? So, so that depends on, on actually the type of cancer. Some cancers are exquisitely sensitive to radiation and you need hardly any and it will disappear, mm. really. Like lymphomas, leukemias, you know, they're very sensitive to chemotherapy. And it used to be that radiation was used a lot in the treatment of these childhood mm. cancers, but because they respond so well to chemo, they're not. But as far as, so, so and some cancers, you, you need to, you, you, sh you treat them with high doses of radiation and, and it barely budges them, it barely does anything. So it depends a lot on the cancer itself. Mm. In a child, uh, how many years does it take to know whether or not uh, a 10 year old or a 12 year old or an 18 year old or a two year old is cancer free? How long do you follow a child? A child who's had treatment for cancer is at risk for long-term side effects, you know, for the rest of their life. Mm. You need to follow them for really forever. You need to look at, so, so you, the risk of the cancer itself coming back is, is highest in the first three to five years after treatment. And then after that, then you start to think about risks from the mm. treatment. So, so we're doing a lot better. We talked about Hodgkin lymphoma, and nobody expects to die from that anymore. So now you expect to be cured. You expect to have your Hodgkin lymphoma treated. But the problem is that the treatments that we use, the chemotherapy and the radiation, they can cause damage which leads to other long-term health problems. And one of those health problems is actually another sort of cancer because of the radiation. Because the normal cells remember having the radiation, you know, they, they never quite recover from it. Mm. So there's always a risk that 10, 20, 25, even 50 years down the line, you might get another cancer just as a result of having that radiation to cure your first one. So is that because of the age? Uh, and the real question is, if you have radiation and you're 50, or radiation and you're five, is because you're so tiny and you're You've got so much longer to live. I, I think. I think that. I think this too. You're, you're right. You've got so much longer to live when you're a kid, and you're treated with cancer. But the other thing is that radiation, especially, and, and chemotherapy to an extent too, affects children and young adults so much more because they are growing and they are developing. Mm. So when you treat a small child with radiation, one of the side effects that's so sad and so difficult to get around is that. That area where you treat with the radiation, it won't grow as much. It really won't. Mm. So in the long term, that will be a problem for that, that person right. as an adult. So you track a child, really, yeah. his or her entire life. Yeah. And, and that depends. You know, when you ask, it depends on, on how much treatment you've had. So 
children who had treatment for leukemia now are managed with chemotherapy. You know, it's it's not that de it's it's not that toxic. There's some mm -hmm. of the long-term side effects they're there, but they're very mild. Whereas if you've had treatment for a brain tumor, and that's a tougher treat tumor to treat, it, it's something where you need a lot of radiation to deal with it then you're much more likely to have serious side effects because you've seen intense chemotherapy, you've seen a lot more radiation. And then in a child, obviously, it's been to your, your head, so it may have affected mm -hmm. your brain and the development of your brain. Okay, so it's more about affecting the development rather than uh, uh, determining whether or not you get cancer of the brain or, or a cancerous tumor. It might. I, it could go either way, it, I'm it, sure. It, it could be, you know, it could be both. Um, for, you know, mm. I have to say it could be both. That's so tough. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult work you do. So I, it, I think it's, it's harder for the people that I see, for the parents of the kids that mm -hmm. we treat. And, and sometimes when you think about trying to cure the cancer, it, it's at a price, and, and sometimes that's a terrible price. Right, and, and what options do you have? So, um, well, I mean, I, I guess when we, we talk about the research that I'm involved with in, in the kayaks, in the childhood and adolescent mm -hmm. and young adult program, we're looking at finding out much more about these late effects. And as time goes on, we find out more about the late effects. That helps to drive, you know, research into doing things better, into looking at different avenues, different options for treatment of childhood cancer. Sure. So as time has gone on, what we've done is we've managed, I mean, especially there's a, something called Wilms tumor where you can treat, you, it's, it's cancer of the kidney. So as time has gone on, we've improved the, the chance of cure for Wilms tumor, but you know also we've decreased the amount of radiation and chemotherapy that we give to kids mm. for Wilms tumor. And that's like the ideal model, and that's what we're striving towards in other childhood cancers. Yes, more of that, and it is Cancer Awareness Month, as you know. Uh, so the cancer agency needs funds, hence the daffodils, right. uh, need, needs to raise money so we can get rid well, they, of I, I think it, this it's, cancer thing. It, it, it's such a complex thing. You know, the questions that you asked have been, they're, they're really, they're great questions, but they're so hard to answer because right. there's so much, there's so much information. Mm. And everyone's different, as yeah. you know so well, as the doctor and the oncologist. It's, uh, I, I know you see miracles all the time and you see things that go sideways and you wonder why, uh, because we're all different. Yeah, and, and so research into that is the Canadian Cancer Society funds the kayak program, mm. and that raises a huge amount of money for research in Canada. And so that's just part of, of the multiple research efforts that are going on to track the problems that we, because you know, we didn't know about, like 20 years ago, we didn't know that kids were going to get these serious problems. Mm -hmm. And now we're more aware of them, but there's still lots of questions sure. to be answered. Like we need to ask more questions about who's affected, who has healthcare problems. And we know now about 20 years from treatment, well, what's it going to be like in 30, 40, 50 years from treatment? What sort of problems are these people going to have? And so the kayaks program, the research I'm involved with, is looking at the healthcare needs of these patients. You know, how are they admitted to hospital? How often and why? And we found out that the admissions to hospital are like way higher than for people who are the same age, same sort of social demographics who didn't have cancer. So we're, 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 try and we're trying to look at community care. We're looking mm -hmm. at, you know, do they get the right screening? So right. obviously if you've had radiation and you're at risk for cancer afterwards, then you need some screening. Sure, and the coordination is so important, as you know. Uh, we'll come back with Dr. Karen Goddard. She works at the BC Cancer Agency. She is a pediatric oncologist and a radiation oncologist.